Thank you very much to Tom, Barnaby, Roche and the whole uh, Future Dance team for this invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be here and to be able to share some of the preliminary findings, tentative conclusion of uh, research we have been embarking on a few years ago. So, it's, um, so this research is um, within a project funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, the project is called Open Water Diplomacy, Media, Science and Transboundary Cooperation in the Land Basin. Um, what I'm presenting today is the research component of this project, which is a sort of action research, because we're working with uh, a network of uh, water journalists based in Sub-Saharan Africa for Water Journalists Africa. NBCBN stands for Nile Basin Capacity Building Network, which is a, a link of maybe a quite tech, no practical names to uh, describe um, a network of water professionals and water researchers, uh, also based in, uh, from different land basin countries. We are working also with CiderNet, which is uh, an organization doing uh, science communication for uh, development. And they have an offices in uh, Cairo and uh, Nairobi. Cairo looks at the uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Nairobi looks at Sub Saharan Africa. And this is already geographically interesting eh? because, in order to uh, deal with Nile Basin, we have to deal with two regional offices, which I think that's already it's a really good indication of the complexity and of, of the difficulties sometimes to think about. The, the basin as a whole, as a, as a community. And we're working with uh, Vitz University, um, in particular with uh, my friend and colleague Eugenio Gagliardone, who has been working a lot on media development and politics in Ethiopia and in Eastern Africa, and they're in charge of the, uh, coordinating the, the research. So, um, why the media and and dance. If you if you're familiar with the with the Nile and the Nile Basin, you know that this year has been um, has been called has been uh, the year of the Nile Basin to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the NBI, the Nile Basin Initiative, which is this intergovernmental platform where uh, government gets together to negotiate both the technical and the political issues related to, uh, to the Nile and to the distribution of its, uh, its water. Egypt at the moment has frozen its um, uh, participation to the, uh, to the NDI. Still, um, 2018 uh, is considered an opportunity to, uh, to celebrate and in uh, this cooperation and of, of course in the way of uh, with the objective of further promoting and boosting. So what I find interesting that uh, the NBI as well as many other uh, institutions like uh, CIU, Stockholm International Water Institute, uh, IMI, International Water Management Institute, they are increasingly working and targeting media and journalists. Uh, this, for instance, it's a, was a tweet by the NBI, and uh, a few days before the official celebration of February 22, you see the, uh, the journalists uh, lining up. <laughs> and they found a quite uh, telling metaphor or, uh, about how those trainings are, are conceived. Eh? So it's uh, with some of the journalists, and usually there is a water expert or a, a water, uh, water scholar telling what journalists should write and uh, how they should write. And so why? Um, so there is this widespread uh, ideas um, or perception that media plays a key role. They perhaps in fueling conflict, they're, they're often accused of misreporting uh, technical information, scientific uh, data about the dam, and they or about doing uh, alarmistic coverage, and therefore they need to be better training, trained in order to um, cover those issues in a more um, balanced or um, effective uh, way. 
Um, so, but all these uh, ideas and initiatives and programs for media, uh, working with the media, are based on, uh, on anecdotal evidence. You may find also in scientific papers, uh, in the introduction, uh, saying, okay, the media, alarmistic report about the media has fueled the uh, water wars narrative in the night basin or in other basin, but um, so far the, there are no uh, studies that really try to understand how the media are talking about uh, the Nile in this case or other international rivers, so we decided to contribute to, to fill this gap by embarking in, in such a in such a research. Um, yeah, so uh, we are working, uh, it's, a, it's an actual research. Uh, it's an actual research because working with journalists and uh, researchers from different areas in countries um, and working on media, uh, of course, um, I think we are also uh, trying to understand and we are reflecting on how, how ourselves as people interested in, uh, in Nile issues or working on Nile issues, how we are uh, using and consuming uh, media news and how our different background, can be national background, but can be also professional background, influences the way we uh, read and we understand the uh, media reports. Um, so the research uh, is, under, uh, is done by a, a team of researchers with two, uh, uh, two Ethiopians, two Egyptians, and one Sudanese. And it's very, uh, I think, for me, the most interesting part of, of this teamwork is when we sit together and we look at the same, uh, we take one or two articles, uh, of course in English because it's also uh, an issue of uh, trying to find a common medium of, uh, not of expression of, of work. So we look at, uh, we've done this for um, articles in English, and of course, it immediately come up uh, that if I'm Ethiopian, I might read a certain headlines in a way completely deep, or might interpret what it resonates some, give me some uh, ideas, emotions, uh, at least it's some emotions which are not the same if I, if I come from Sudan or if I come from uh, Egypt. So, uh, there is a natural research. We are also uh, doing some training, um, not only for the journalists but also for the researchers because I think uh, we realize that maybe one of the problems is also the way researchers and scientists are communicating or not communicating their own uh, finding their own research, therefore I think it, it's also important to, um, to train and to uh, build the skills of the uh, academic community to, to better cooperate. Uh, of course, there are many uh, trainings available on how to use uh, your, uh, how to use social media to communicate your research and I think <coughs> why we added and we did our own online training on uh, science communication for water diplomacy, again, because learning from the research, of course, and even from uh, previous analysis and our knowledge about the, the region, uh, I think most of those training that are targeting research and academics on science communication, uh, they think about uh, doing science communication maybe in Manchester University or in the Netherlands and, for instance, uh, while we started the, the research and the project, Ethiopia was under state of emergency. Um, all social media uh, were blocked, so would it make sense to train researchers on how to use social media? Those are the things for, for science communication. Those are the things that um, we tend to forget, and one of the ideas of this project is also to foreground the political dimension of science uh, communication. So we created, uh, we designed and ran an online course uh, on science communication for water diplomacy in the Nile Basin, which was trying to foreground also the, the political dimension and the political implications of science communication um, in the Nile Basin. And then the, the idea is that one, uh, after uh, training 
journalist and researcher. The idea was trying to facilitate cooperation and co-production among researchers and journalists uh, about uh, of reports and media coverage that would incorporate also some uh, scientific findings in uh, in the future and hopefully that would be transboundary. So trying to have journalists and researchers from different nine countries covering similar issues in their own countries or even traveling to another country and uh, collaborate um, with each other because that's another uh, big issue we learn that the fact that for journalists, Ethiopian journalists, uh, it's very difficult to travel uh, to Egypt and the same is true for instance for Ethiopian or uh, Egyptian or Sudanese who want to travel to Ethiopia um, and cover for instance dumb issues and that's why indeed those training like uh, the one you saw at the beginning by the NBI are still very relevant because it's one of the few opportunities that journalists have to travel to other countries and uh, meet people, meet experts and interview them, having field work and so on. So what I'm presenting today is part of the, uh, is the research. Um, our research, uh, as, as a background of the research, we are building on two um, main debates. The one on media and conflict, uh, so the role of media in, in conflict, and the one, uh, since there's no so far debate on uh, media, the role of media and water, uh, but there is a growing interest and attention has been paid on media and climate change. We are uh, taking some of the uh, concept or the approach and the idea of this debate of media and climate change and trying to see whether it makes sense also to apply to uh, media and uh, what and transboundary uh, water. What is also uh, interesting and is that uh, most of this uh, research on media and climate change has been done by looking at uh, media outlets in either in the US or in Europe or in Australia and there's very little research uh, on <clears throat> uh, about media in the so-called global south. So indeed I think we hope also to make uh, a contribution and to point at the direction for, uh, for future research by looking also at, at local media in uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan, and Uganda. Uh, so what we are doing is um, we're doing about the content analysis, a more quantitative uh, study trying to really to count uh, who are the voices, who are the, the expert the people who are interviewed or who are mentioned in articles, how figures and numbers are used. Um, are they used? Um, how many figures, numbers um, in each article? Um, we are looking at the countries which are mentioned in the, in the, in the report, eh? in, uh, in, in media articles. And we are looking at whether um, scientific um, information, reports, studies are quoted or, or not. Uh, <clears throat> and then we uh, are doing also discourse analysis uh, along three main uh, themes. So we are looking at the, um, we are trying to um, we identify those three themes or reals or uh, I think now we, we are rather calling repertoire. Uh, what is, and for us a repertoire is a sort of uh, basket or, or a, a toolbox that the journalists can open and use to describe and to frame uh, the nine or the dam in a specific way. So uh, we've been looking and after reading we came up with three main repertoire, so we have the, the nine or the dam frame as a, as a political uh, object, a political river, a political dam. Uh, another repertoire emphasized the, um, the relation and the, uh, the cultural or the uh, dimension of the river, how the nine is uh, shaping identities um, in different countries. And the third one is more the um, technical um, 
real a technical framing of nine issues as a uh, or uh, done as a um, catalyst for development. So here we have all the yeah the, the more technical. Uh, so when it's framed less politically, so where the political dimension, the contentious element are uh, set put aside and it's rather it's focused on hydropower, on the benefits of the dam in terms of economic growth and, and so on. Um, we, um, so we have identified for uh, each country, so we are looking, so the research is mostly, our main interest is on debate in uh, the eastern uh, nine basin. So the main focus is Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. Uh, then we are taking, uh, we took uh, Uganda as a country which is, can be considered sort of external actor, but still within the basin, which is looking at how, so how you, uh, the Uganda media are framing the controversies between in the eastern uh, Nile as a, but as a, also an inner player in the basin, and then we're taking the international media to get a global uh, view and how the, uh, those issues are framed for global uh, audiences. Um, of course, there are many questions about how this uh, media uh, outlet have been, have been selected. Uh, and maybe we can discuss it. I can give you also further clarification in the in the debate. Um, there were uh, with, uh, we tried to follow and we had to balance uh, different criteria. So the first one was to uh, we wanted to try to get um, different voices, both uh, a voice close to the government uh, and then a voice of an independent, private uh, media. Uh, of course, it's very, for instance, this was very uh, easy in Uganda, where you clearly have government and opposition. Media was much more difficult in Ethiopia. Uh, and you wonder why, for instance, the, for instance we took uh, the reporter and not the, not the Ethiopian air. Because also the second criteria was that um, we want to look also at the, how uh, these articles, these news are consumed. So we were looking for a uh, media outlet that allow um, comments either directly on the website by, by the readers, either directly on the website or in their Facebook page. If you go to the general, you will see Facebook page, you will see there are no uh, comments. Uh, while uh, in the, the reporter was much more um, active. Uh, we were trying also to have, uh, to select media that were somehow uh, comparable between um, different countries. So for instance, we found that uh, uh, yeah, Alaram online uh, Alaram, for instance, has both, uh, has like a report about an English and Arabic version, uh, and the report has English and Amharic, because that was also interesting for us to see whether uh, those media are reporting and framing the issue uh, in the local language and in the English version with the same uh, standards, or rather there are uh, discrepancies and differences. So, and they also represent somehow um, I would say authoritative or uh, good quality uh, journalism. Uh, uh, those are media outlets that have or used to have dedicated journalists that were covering uh, the nine, which is not always uh, the case. So there, there is a um, yeah, different criteria, and of course, it's still uh, we had also to work with the brain. For instance, we. Uh, for Sudan, there was this uh, very interesting media outlet that, which was also um, comparable with other in other country uh, with other media in, in other country. But then they ended up a publication in 2014, and the owner founded a new one. So we had also to uh, to follow the owner in this case. Uh, <clears throat> 
now we are doing the. Um, so this is about the sampling uh, of our um, data. Um, we did. Uh, we started by uh, sampling for according to events. So we identify uh, key events, uh, one per year, starting from 2013. Because we thought, okay, in order to find a critical mass of uh, um, debate media uh, reports and debates, let's try to sample around uh, key events. So we identified one event per year, and we sampled uh, one week before the event and one month after the, uh, the event. But as you can see from those three um, uh, facts, um, we realized that uh, maybe there was a sort of also of political bias because um, well the diversion of the blue nine is a bit uh, an exception because uh, if you think about uh, that's when Ethiopian diverted the, the blue nine to start building the, the Ethiopian uh, the, the gap which it, per se is quite, of course, it's highly symbolical, but it's also a very technical uh, event. Event, you could, uh, as a journalist, you could frame it as, a, as the, um, the human uh, capacity to divert the oldest river and the, uh, the oldest river on the earth. Eh? It's so human, so it could be framed as a technical, as an environmental, uh, issues, but indeed was uh, framed mostly as a, as a political um, debate and as a political uh, controversy between uh, Ethiopia, particularly and Egypt, uh, as well as the uh, leakage of the international panel of experts. Again, is a, you could imagine, okay, it's a panel of experts, uh, there was the report uh, by a panel of experts about the uh, in uh, ecological and uh, social impact of the dam. So you might imagine, okay, there's a lot of uh, scientific or technical information. No, again, it was a political uh, event and part of between the two governments. The declaration of principle indeed is an intergovernmental event. But so, because uh, to check whether this was uh, indeed was really. Uh, polit uh, indeed, the political lens and political frame was the main uh, lens through which uh, nine issues are, are, are reported. We said, okay, for 2016, 17, and 18, instead of uh, identifying a key event, we do random sampling uh, by searching through keywords like Nile, uh, GERD, and so on. <clears throat> and we ended up, I I'll show you some. Uh, some result of, of this. So this is about um, the content analysis. Eh? Uh, for instance, we are counting which countries or which nine basic countries are, are mentioned in the in each article. And I think uh, so. This is um, aggregated for all the the media outlet, um, <coughs> and you can see. So the, the blue <laughs> columns are the blue nine countries, and uh, so you have Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia in dark blue, this one. Um, so why we're doing this? Uh, talking with uh, Mina Diekis, is an ethnomusicologist, is uh, the founder of the Night Project. I don't know if you're familiar. It's a, it's a group of musicians from different countries getting together to, uh, to per they perform and they create new music uh, as a way also of promoting a sparkling curiosity about uh, the nine, uh, nine issues and promote interest in on nine issues also uh, and a dialogue between different uh, communities and he was telling me the first when I have to recruit someone from our project, my first question is, can you list all the countries of the Nile Basin? Because uh, he was telling me, we as Egyptian, we tend to think that the, the Nile ends with Sudan or South Sudan. Eh? We know very little about 
was going on <laughs> at the sources of the of the White Nile, and even which are the countries. So indeed, uh, starting to look at which countries are mentioned in uh, in the media when the Nile or the Dam issues are covered was a sort that we thought we thought it could be a, a good proxy to to discuss and see whether. Um, the media uh, try also to whether we can imagine or there is a sort of uh, understanding that the Nile is also uh, that there is a shared and broader community eh, around the, around the Nile, um, and this is also uh, why we did this because um, so this is for instance only Al Aram. Um, in Egypt, the Arabic one, and that's also interesting because, uh, of course, you can see that uh, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia are, uh, are the country usually mentioned, and the other very little. But look, I think this is very really interesting because you can see also how sometimes the Nile, even within the, the Blue Nile, and when uh, we are talking about the the Gap, sometimes. Like here, the the issue is framed as a bilateral. So, and Sudan, you see, is almost like South Sudan. Eh? So very, is almost absent from the picture. And what we found that when the Nile or Gerd issues are framed bilaterally, uh, as a bilateral issue only between Ethiopia and Sudan, forget uh, Ethiopia and Egypt, forgetting that Sudan is in the middle, but also it does stay. Then immediately the tone, the argument gets much more confrontational. Uh, the, the rhetoric, the narratives are those of uh, conflict, the water wars, the, um, the word it uses is a wording that uh, refers a lot to the to warfare and uh, negative emotion. So, and as soon as Sudan is in the picture. And the thing is, uh, and the issue is framed as a multilateral. This open up uh, ways of at least listing, okay, uh, the potential cooperation, eh? potential agreement between different countries, sharing of water, but sharing also of uh, hydropower or benefits, economic benefits uh, of using the um, the Nile uh, water. So, uh, is. So those are the kind of analysis that we are doing with uh, the um, content analysis. We are also looking at the, so the countries to see what kind of community uh, we are thinking about when we talk about the nine and the voices. Eh? Uh, who's talking, who, uh, whose voice, whose, uh, whose expertise is brought in uh, when uh, nine issues are discussed. And here, as you can see, this again is aggregated, uh, and there is indeed an overwhelming uh, majority of uh, political voices. Politicians are the grey column, uh, officials, meaning uh, like ministry, like diplomats or um, people from ministry of water and irrigation, are also very much represented, and they, maybe you could think, okay, they are almost the same, eh? so this would be even higher. Uh, then we are trying to understand when and how experts and scientists are also mentioned, are also invited to, to talk. And what well, indeed, this is not, uh, of course, those are categories that look quite you know, clear, but you can, I, I think, if you're familiar with the negotiation of the nine, and you know that also many experts, many scientists are also uh, hired or work with government as advisor in the um, to the negotiation team, for instance. And then a problem was how do we uh, count those uh, those people? Are they um, scientists expert or do they belong to uh, this column of? Um, Officials and people working for for ministry. So what we decided to do is that if the uh, I don't know I'm, I'm familiar with Ethiopia, so uh, I'm 
thinking, for instance, of Jakob Alzano, who is professor of, uh, at Addis Ababa University of International Relations, and is also technical advisor to the uh, Ethiopian delegation in the tripartite uh, negotiation with Egypt and Sudan. So if Jakob is mentioned as Addis Ababa University, of course, we put it under uh, expert scientists. Or if it's mentioned as um, presented as a delegate, Ethiopian delegate, of course, we put it under uh, the column. But just, I think this is also to recall that those data are, of course, uh, might tell, I think, may give us good insight, but the, the, the reality is much more complex. <laughs> And that's why we are also uh, doing discourse analysis. Um, and again, I will briefly share some of the findings from the discourse analysis in relation, uh, related to Ethiopia and to the international uh, media, because those uh, are the two parts of the research in which I also uh, contributed. So, uh, as I told you before, we are uh, looking, we found that there were three recurrent uh, themes or uh, repertoires in all the, the media coverage. And for instance, in Ethiopia, you have the, the first one is about culture and identity. And for each uh, theme, we identify uh, sub themes, like, um, for instance, in this case, um, in, the, in the Ethiopian media, uh, the dam is framed, uh, is pretty much related to identity and to, to the identity of the country, the people, in two main ways. Either by referring to the debate, uh, by framing it in, within the debate of Pan-Africanism versus colonialism. So there is, there was the colonial agreement of the sharing of the Nile water, and now Ethiopia, as a champion of the Pan-Africanism, is trying to uh, renegotiate and subvert the colonial uh, order and uh, previous agreement by building the dam and therefore by empowering also uh, downstream and um, country against the colonial heritage. And then there is a more uh, national uh, discourse, what we call the we argument. So this is a dam built by the Ethiopians, is financed by the Ethiopians, mostly for uh, the Ethiopians, but also for, as an example, for, uh, without donors' money, as an example for uh, the world of Africa. So, a really uh, a national uh, discourse, a nationalist discourse. The dam is also framed uh, as a political dam. And here we have two main sub -team. So, the dam as a source of conflict with Egypt. So, here we have mostly uh, the issue frame as a bilateral relations with Egypt uh, um, and, and the overall tone is that okay, in spite of Egypt being uh, preoccupied or being uh, against the dam, Ethiopia will still stand and will complete uh, the dam. So uh, no matter, and that's where the, you have tones, as I was saying before, tones and arguments that are quite uh, confrontational. Or, uh, but there is also a second sub-theme, is that is water as a source of cooperation. And here, it's when, for instance, Sudan is brought into the picture, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of coverage about uh, the bilateral relations with, between Ethiopia and Sudan, how they are, have been improving in the, in the past years, and, uh, and so on. Um, third theme is um, the more technical one, um, which is also linked to this idea of cooperation. So it's a uh, done for uh, development. Here is when uh, the media try to present the dam as a uh, less confrontational or less uh, controversial issue, highlighting the benefits of the GERD at regional level. So for instance, uh, the GERD is not longer simply a national project for Ethiopia by Ethiopia, but becomes a regional now. So something that can benefit uh, the whole region. 
and but it, or there is an emphasis of the uh, on the, the benefits of the care for uh, the national economy of Ethiopia, and particularly in terms of uh, climate change resilience, production of uh, clean energy, hydropower energy, and, and so. So, and we're doing those kind of analysis uh, for each of our case study. And next week, we'll get together and have to also to compare the findings and the different uh, debates in each of the country. At the international level, also there uh, we find similar uh, <coughs> patterns. So this, for instance, how um, the dam and the nine are framed as a political object in the international media, in the Guardian and uh, Al Jazeera. So, uh, it, again, we have uh, the um, two main sub is uh, water as a source of conflict or water as a source of uh, cooperation. And here I find two things which are quite interesting, that uh, when it comes to conflict, uh, even in the, in the international media tends to forget that there is Sudan between Ethiopia and Egypt, and they simply frame it as a bilateral. And this is uh, all the narratives about the water wars right, that you find much more in the international media than in the <coughs> local ones. And then you have the, um, the cooperation uh, sub theme, so water as a potential source uh, for potential cooperation. And what I find, for instance, interesting in these um, headlines of uh, uh, Al Jazeera is that even when uh, international media are talking about co potential cooperation on the Nile, the way it is framed is it still as a um, against the water war narratives. So why this make the news? Why cooperation make the news? Because in a long history of conflicts and tensions about the sharing of the Nile water. Finally, the country get together and, for instance, sign the, the DOP. So, the cooperation, ele the cooperation element is framed, is presented as a, uh, by subtraction. Eh? So, usually it's what to war, but this makes the news because, finally, they manage to cooperate. So, this is the way uh, we think the international media represent uh, nine controversies with a strong emphasis on the water war uh, narrative. I don't, I don't know if you've seen the, there was a, well, not recent, last year, a BBC documentary with uh, 360 very fancy video documentary, and the title was The Water War is Brewing Over Nine Waters. This, in, uh, this is another um, theme, is the Nile uh, as a cultural uh, river, as a river um, that shaped the identity of people and countries. And here what we find that uh, identity and uh, culture are uh, pretty much linked to history. So again, in the national media, of course you don't have this, in, uh, there's a lot of coverage also in the Egyptian media, for instance, about culture and the role and the importance of the Nile in uh, cultural and identity terms. But of course, when uh, often in the media, uh, when they start talking about the Nile, they start from the pharaohs. Right? And then, so it's Egypt, the pharaohs, the Nile has been key to the Egyptian civilization since history. Then, the pharaohs are set aside and you go into the um, uh, contemporary. With, it's interesting that, for instance, all the colonial history, eh, you can take the Guardian, for instance. Uh, why? I mean, the British played a key role in even in framing the Nile Basin as a wall basin, but this part of the history is not, is not present. So you have the, uh, the pharaohs and then contemporary. But still, so with the idea that uh, for Egypt, the Nile uh, was, I mean, the, the Nile has been key for the Egyptian civilization 
since the Pharaoh's time, and that helped uh, Egypt to achieve a glorious past. I mean, Egypt has been the master of the region, and not in the past, and now is declining. Eh? Now uh, Egypt is at risk. Uh, this influence since the building of the dam is declining. So Egypt, in a way, is presented as looking back, looking backwards to a past of um, an era of glory, of mastering the region, being the, uh, some colleagues would say, the water hegemon in the region. Um, and now, and, and Ethiopia is the opposite. Ethiopia is rising. Ethiopia looks at the future. Ethiopia is looking at the, is building the dam and looking at the future, while Egypt is, uh, is being affected by the dam and is losing its past um, prominence and power. What I find interesting that, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> I think there are a few Ethiopian colleagues here who would uh, maybe uh, can tell us much better than I could the importance and the relevance for, uh, of the Nile also for the Egyptian uh, culture. But this is often um, forgotten, at least in the international media. So, the, the Mazan Ingista is an Ethiopian uh, writer, novelist. I think she's based in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US. And she was telling, hey, uh, this is an opinion article uh, which was highlighting also the importance of the Nile for the Egyptian, uh, for the Ethiopian identity and culture. So the Nile belongs to Ethiopia too. In, cultural terms, uh, which we often tend to forget when we simply look at history as something for the Egyptian and future um, for the uh, Ethiopian. So, uh, we're still working and digesting our uh, data, so the slide about the conclusion is still quite empty. Uh, and so what I would like to share with you and to also perhaps to open the debate is a question which we are still working at because um, one of the main conclusion and message and also what we are telling to or we are discussing with our with the journalists we are working with is that our impression and from the data we got is that uh, we are still all caught in what we call the national trap. So, and you've seen also throughout my presentation, I was talking about Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, I was talking in terms of countries, because indeed we are doing this analysis on a case studies which are country-based, because the media systems are national media systems. So, for instance, when it comes to the, yeah, you, you see, Egypt sees Ethiopia, so the country, are portrayed as the main character of this play. They are personified. They feel emotions. Egypt, Egypt feared the building of the dam. Ethiopia react. So the character of the play are the country. They are personified. Who speaks? Who's the voice of those characters? Most of the time is the voice of their political leaders. There's no space for um, let's say, alternative voices, alternative views or opinion within each country uh, about the dam. About the All the Ethiopians are united behind the dam. There's no position, there's no, at least from the media, there's no um, discussion or controversies within the, the countries. What is interesting is that you find um, you find the same countries represented as divided within their own uh, constituencies only in the media of the other countries. So, for instance, uh, the Ethiopian media is presenting Egypt as uh, in this array with uh, not clear agenda or strategy to uh, confront or to face or to negotiate with Ethiopia about uh, the time. Or, uh, was interesting, the, um, the Egyptian um, media were uh, highlighting protests by the uh, Oromo 
uh, these students were living in Cairo in front of the Ethiopian embassy went um, against the construction uh, of the dam when the the panel of uh, the report of the panel of experts was uh, read the lead. So the Egyptian media text also tried to portray Ethiopia are divided. Uh, on TV, there was also an interview of an Ethiopian leader, opposition leader, I don't know who is he, but uh, if you want, I can show you later the, the video, telling that all this was just a political uh, operation by the government, the building of the dam, to divert from, uh, international, uh, from internal issues and opposition. It was the time of the Obama protest and, and so on. So, um, I will put in this uh, nation trap and which are the consequences uh, of this framing in terms of uh, national interest without unpacking the distribution of water within each country. Uh. So, for instance, we say Sudan will benefit from the building of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam because it can, uh, Sudan will be able to irrigate uh, twice a year the, the plains. But who is going to benefit from uh, the food that will be produced and then perhaps exported to the, to the Arab countries, the Gulf countries? So those kind of analyses are missing. Um, and in, I think this is part, of course, there is a structural problem and the way, as I said, the media are, um, the media systems are, are what, are built, so it's a national system, they, they use different uh, national and local languages. It's also part of our uh, mindset as researchers. We organize the research, of course, in national teams. The Egyptians are looking at the Egyptian uh, media, the Ethiopians at the Ethiopian media, and, and so on. Um, which are the implications and the consequences? And can we imagine um, new communities? Eh? I think I'm thinking about uh, Benedict Anderson, his idea, uh, his notion of imagined communities. Um, if you go back to that analysis, a key role is played by national media. Right? The rise of national media also led to the, uh, the promotion of the idea of nation, national interest, and so on. So, is there a way of thinking about uh, new communities and how the river? or infrastructure like a dam can facilitate or hamper such, a, uh, such new communities. So those are the questions that are open for debate. And what's next? Um, as Tom was saying, we, um, we also host as a project a podcast, uh, which is called The Sources of the Night. And you can find it on uh, iTunes or on SoundCloud, or on the website nilewaterlab.org. And so we ended up, uh, we concluded a series of first uh, eight episodes, where we are um, with, uh, as guests, both researchers and journalists, uh, to discuss how the media and science communication are uh, unfolding uh, uh, in Nile politics. So what we would like to do uh, as a next step is to, uh, in, in the new series, uh, what we will do is to start sharing the um, findings of our research, so selecting a few um, big ideas, like this one of the National Trap. Uh, so we will present those findings, and then we will ask journalists or so-called water diplomats to comment, do they agree or do they disagree, uh, our analysis and why, with the idea to, um, so to elicit the debate, but also to generate new uh, findings and new data about uh, how these, because so far we've been looking mostly at content and narratives. So what we will still think it's important to understand is why news are produced in this way. Second, how we consume those news, and third, which, is, which are the implications for negotiation? Are there any implications uh, of specific narratives 
in terms of uh, facilitating or hampering negotiation and cooperation of uh, over nine issues. And then we will also invite guests from other river basins to try to learn from what's going on in other river basins. So stay tuned and we hope to keep on discussing and engaging in a conversation on those issues. So thank you very much. Thank you.